Good morning and welcome to Weekend Walkabout and our Gardens and Years Virtually. This is uh, GardenAtoZ.org bringing this to you. I'm Janet McConovich. I'm Stephen Nicola. And today we're concluding Collector's Gardens, the harmonizing diversity if you want to collect all those neat plants. Um, you you know us already. We're right. We're retired professional gardeners who can't retire from <laughs> teaching and writing about gardening. And our daughter, Sonia Nicola, who's moderating for us. Um, and you know that there is uh, uh, material on our website on the audience materials page where you can download the list that we're going to be talking about and our tips. And uh, to remind you, for those who are here for the first part and to, to uh, introduce you anew, the people who are just coming for the first time. Uh, Pierre Benerup is a friend of ours, but more importantly, he is, although now retired, or he says he's retired, from running a nursery. He ran one of the largest nurseries in the in the world, mm -hmm. well, perennial nurseries in the world. And uh, he was one of the first people to take perennials in the 70s from being bare root plants to putting them in pots. And it totally revolutionized the perennial market. Um, perennial scale sales just went through the roof by the late 70s. Um, and Pierre is not just from his nursery, but in the industry, um, you can find nursery management, horticultural magazine, uh, find gardening, all writing about Pierre and the things that he's done, starting to grow plants from tissue culture, his visions, his contributions through starting the Perennial Plant Association. He's just one of the lions of the perennial industry. And he agreed to yeah. talk about perennials for us. His wife is also here, Cheryl Bella. And if I was to tell you what Cheryl's horticultural accomplishments were, we'd have to go on for too long. So we won't do that. Just let you know that Cheryl and Pierre Benerup are going to take it from here, from where we were before. Um, Stephen, if you close the participants window, because there is a, uh, uh oh, there is there. Can you press resume? There we go. So we, uh, last time that we were together with uh, Pierre and Cheryl, we talked about these plants and we've made it all the way down to hellebores. So we're gonna start with hellebores. Morning, Pierre, morning, Cheryl. Well, morning. Good, good morning. We finally have some nice weather here. We've been in dreary, miserable, uh, depressing, cloudy, not too cold, not too warm. Now we see some sunshine, I'm very happy for that. Yeah, the uh, sun has been wonderful. Wonderful. And we're supposed to have a week of it, which I'm very happy for. I can't wait till it gets warm enough so I can work outside full time. Uh, back to your previous conversation. I, one note, somebody asked about keeping uh, woodpeckers away. The only way that I've ever seen that's successful is to buy one of those plastic owls. Generally, you'll, garden centers may have them or the, one of the big box stores have them. At worst, maybe Amazon might have it. Uh, and, uh, you know, they seem to have everything. So uh, I, I don't know any other way to keep woodpeckers away. And, of course, it'll also keep songbirds away. So you have to be careful where you put it. Yeah. All yeah. right. Um, we're on collecting. And two weeks ago, I was it two weeks ago? It seems like that. I um, tried to describe the difference between a true gardener and a true collector, both of which are perfectly legitimate enter uh, enterprises, but quite different. Um, but I'm going to go define it a little bit differently today. A gardener, a true gardener is like an artist. Um, can use uh, five different plants to make a perfectly wonderful garden, five different species, let's say. Uh, could use more, but I mean, it's possible. It's like... Jamie Oliver on TV makes a, a, a full meal with five different ingredients, that sort of thing. You know, that's that. Um, or you might even talk about a, a, a painter who can paint with five different colors. The, the, the true gardener is an artist at heart and wants to create a vision of, of beauty. A true collector rarely has the artistic motivation wants one of everything, okay? One of this, one of the, if you have two, as I said earlier, the other one is either to trade for some plant you don't have or to give away to a friend. You don't want two of any plant, which makes it extremely difficult to make, make any kind of a sensible garden. Um, 
Now, I, I fall somewhere in the middle, which is impossible. I tried to be <laughs> both at the same time. And, and generally, it doesn't work out, you know? You either have to decide which way you're going to go. And so I uh, I would never be you know, voted as uh, Gardener of the Year. Uh, I, 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 on the other hand, I do have some artistic sense, but I also like to collect. The other thing I'd say is the, the true gardener is more concerned with the color of the flower, the blooming time of the flower, the, the nature of the plant, whether it's shade or sun, the type of foliage, uh, and so forth. The collector couldn't care less about any of those things. All he cares about is what the botanic name is. <laughs> and that's something that most gardeners don't really care much about, you know, whether it's a common name or whatever. They they don't. That's the last factor in buying a plant. So I'm going on to Helleborus. OK, sorry for that little uh, first speech there. Uh, no problem. Helleborus, Helleborus, 50 years ago, we're, we're not anything in the in the world of uh, horticulture. They have become like the most important spring plant of all. You know, there are other groups that occupy different parts of the season, like daylilies, hostas, uh, heucheras. But the first part of spring is dominated in the trade by hellebores. And for good reason, the breeders have made some fantastic developments. There are doubles, there are bicolors, there are tricolors, there are are very floriferous ones. There are ones that the flowers look up rather than down. There, there are so many different things. There are hundreds of new varieties. And if you have a garden that wants color in the early spring, that, that's a very good choice. I will also say some of the newer and better varieties can be very, very expensive. But it's a very durable plant. And, you know, when in a few years, you'll have a, a huge clump, maybe more than a yard wide from each plant, and typically hundreds of flowers. It also has a very nice glossy foliage, which looks pretty all the way through the year. There's a picture of one, which is a bicolor, uh, single flowering, but still very, very attractive. Uh, I, I would say that the, the, the big box stores have gotten into this to some extent, too. And I've seen some very nice plants uh, at the big box stores. I, I generally like to buy at the independents, but I'm always curious to see what the big box stores are doing. So from this yeah. point on in the spring, you might take a look at your nearest big box stores and see what, what treasures they have. Okay, that's my yeah. my yeah. bit on, on um, hellebores. The, um, the picture that's on the screen now of the buds is one that, it, it must have a bunch of hellebores niger the christmas rose in it because yeah. it's, it's had those buds for quite a while um what's your what's your experience with those very very early blooming ones do they do they make it through the the snow and whatever blooming is early? Well, this year this year they're likely to here because we we had rarely been below 20 degrees and typically we're a zone six and go below zero and this late in the season, I doubt that we're going to go below 20 degrees. So they, they will do well. Do they bloom at Christmas here? I've never seen that happen. They bloom early spring, late, late March into, well, they bloom a very long time. So you'll see them all the way into May. The flowers eventually may have started off pink or red, but they eventually turn to sort of a chartreuse color. And they stay on the plant for a long time. Uh, the Lenten rose is the one that is most commonly um, used as a breeding stock. So, and uh, that one blooms in starting probably late March and well into May. Okay, I see. Uh, oh, Janet is asking about sun or shade for Lenten rose. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. They're they're really best in the shade. But I know I know of some very nice looking plants that are in pretty full sun, as long as they have enough water, uh, they will they will look good and in, in, they will manage to stay pretty in, in a, a sunny spot, okay? But they bloom well in the shade, so. Yeah, yeah they'll bloom both, both ways, yeah. 